Okay. So that everyone hears me? Should hear you now, yeah. All right. Hi, everyone. Uh, I'm Joe Garth. I think you've seen in the last webinar, uh, we looked at uh, basically what I've been doing for the last, I say, eight years at Crytek um, and how that's uh, how I'm sort of putting together sort of cinematic scenes uh, and how we're doing that cinematic storytelling. Uh, in this uh, presentation, we'll concentrate more on sort of cinematic language and the rules of composition uh, and how we sort of uh, use a basic cinematic terminology uh, and sort of uh, atmospherics and lightings in the engine so we can tell stories. Um, so yeah, before we create any cinematic shots, we really need to know sort of what the story is that we want to tell. Uh, and usually that starts with the script writing process. Uh, so you can see here I've sort of labeled uh, and sort of set out at least the, the sort of general pipeline that I like to use when making cinematics. It all starts with sort of creating the script and then you go on to doing you know, the staging, framing, movement and pacing. And we go into those a bit later. So the script is really, it's a document that you can create that allows you to see exactly what the end result should be in the perfect situation. So if you begin the script writing process and you, you have some idea in your mind of how your cinematic should feel and how it should translate onto the screen, that's what you write into your script. So it's your very basic idea, it's your characters, it's your plot, it's your story, and it's eventually what is the feeling, what's the sort of big idea about this. Uh, so that's all going into your script. When you move on from the script, once you have this locked down and in place, and you've, you know, ideally you'd want to show this to say you're a director or uh, depends who you're working with, maybe it's your best friend, and, and you get that script approved. And then you would kind of move on to your staging. And staging is something that's uh, very important because this allows you to actually uh, lock down composition very early on. So you're not doing something like polishing an entire cinematic and then finding out later on that this is somehow not telling the story you originally set out to create. So you're making sure that your staging follows your scripts. And that's why if you look on this example, you have the, you know, the typical block out, which is just like, you know, they make the character out of cubes, they make the chair out of boxes, and then uh, try and get as far as they possibly can with the story there before moving on to rendering and, and lighting. Uh, so this allows you to sort of quickly iterate on changes and kind of go back and, and you know, uh, redo the sort of lighting and without sort of having to go back and redo the lighting and animation each time. Uh, so in the next webinar, I'll focus more about sort of previs and script writing. But for this one, it's more about how do we go about staging a scene uh, and how do we go about sort of conveying within a shot uh, what we want to, t to convey about our story. Uh, so do we want to make a sense of mystery or do we want a sense of insanity in the image? Is that something that comes across with just a single shot that you get this idea that Rapid's insane and Bruce Willis is going like, are you, in, are you serious? And then the camera's actually reflecting this too because it's sort of tilted to the side and it's, it's everything in that shot is, is this madhouse look, you know what I mean? Uh, or do, you know, are you going even even further? Are you are you sort of trying to convey something like jealousy? You know, here you've got a, a character that's kind of intruding on a on a relationship that you've set up in the movie, uh, and he's kind of intervening there and creating a physical barrier between the two characters that have got this relationship established. So you know, Han Solo looks a bit like, oh, who's this charming guy coming in and trying to steal my girl? This is something that's all sort of cleverly laid out within the layout of the shot. And it's done intentionally so that you can feel this within the story. Uh, it's, it's staging is actually complementing the story and getting across the character's feelings and motivations. So that's what, sort of one thing to, to think about with a camera placement is how do you, how do you sort of uh, enhance uh, the feelings and motivations of characters uh, just by choosing a, a good camera position. Uh, and that stuff about uh, thinking about how your point of view uh, where your point of view is from and your field of view. 
so for example, in this shot from Jurassic Park, it's you know it's, it's all about the sort of selling the fragility and the sort of that fear factor of oh you know something that's a very ordinary object doing something that's uh, not normal. It's it's vibrating and it's it's very uh, it's very fragile. The other thing you could do is, of course, create mystery by, uh, around a character. You know, for instance, just showing a single part of the character, like their boots on the floor. It's this sort of mysterious presence. Uh, you know, who is this guy? Why is he there? Uh, what's the sort of uh, what's the meaning of this? What, why is he why is he coming into the scene? And uh, and we don't actually get to see who he is. Is he a bad guy or a good guy? <clears throat> the other thing that usually people don't usually think about is what uh, who is the cameraman and why is he actually filming the scene or I is it a person who's filming the scene is it a drone or is it you know something like that you know for instance a movie like cloverfield everything is shot in this very handheld sort of way and it's very shaky and it's it's clearly a guy who is you know on the ground he's he's you know the boots are on the ground with the soldiers and he's trying to keep track of everything uh but finding it very difficult and this adds to that that feeling that they've actually thought through that it's the the camera is an actor in, in itself, uh, or or is it, for instance, a drone? You know, looking out from overhead. Uh, is it some someone that's kind of uh, surveying the area? Or e even another another cool trick is to make it that the camera is in fact completely static, uh, and is in a way just waiting for the action. Uh, so in this movie, this is a movie called Hunger uh, from the director Steve McQueen, not the actor. Um, in which there, there's a, a five, I think it's actually five or six minutes long uh, shot of just the janitor cleaning the floor of the prison after the prisoners have uh, started rioting. And it's just this very long shot of a janitor just slowly going back mopping this floor. And it just, you know, it contrasts with that sort of huge action scene that had happened before with people getting thrown about uh, and tossed in all directions. So how do we go about sort of setting up a scene? Um, usually the first thing to establish is a line of action. So this is usually between the two opposing parties in the scene. So if you have, for instance, a conversation between two people, uh, you'd have uh, this line of action going straight through that conversation between the two sides. And then you have to pick which side of the line of action you're going to be on. You can't cross this line. If you do this, you're breaking the sort of uh, one of the sort of integral rules of cinematography, which is the axis rule or the 180 degree rule. I think some people also call it the, uh, the semicircle rule or half sorry half circle rule. Uh, and this is sort of like one of the, one of the sort of very important uh, ways that you can establish order and understanding in your cinema uh, cinematography. So. Pretty much pick your line of action and then stick to just one half circle. So here, you know, it's okay to have uh, cameras that are on all of different angles as long as they're not crossing over this red line. There are times when you can break this rule, but pretty much if you're starting out with cinematography, it's usually not the best thing to start breaking this rule all the time. It's usually something that if you adhere to it, you will usually find that your scenes become more understandable uh, people will be able to follow cuts from shot to shot, but still understand where characters are in relation to the scene, and you know who's saying who to what, uh, who's saying what to uh, to each other. You know, so it's usually usually a good one to follow. And as a sort of general rule of thumb is the um, if you have characters that are sort of leaving the scene or retreating, running away, it's usually that they would be running left to right. Whereas, contrary to that, you have the other way, which is that they are running, sort of arriving, uh, sorry, they are sort of arriving or chasing somebody, and that's usually right to left. Uh, that's just usually the way that we read things in, in Western culture, is that we are usually reading right to left, and it just usually looks better that way. Uh, it's one of those things that just sort of underlying, people have discovered, uh, for a Western audience at least, you do read it that way, uh, right to left for arriving and chasing. So if you were doing that for a, a, an audience from a different culture, perhaps in, the, in a culture where you read the opposite way around RTL, it could, it could be. would I've, it change those rules, do you think? Or did they pretty much stay the same across 
most of cinematography. I think at this point, it's probably it's probably sticking to the Western uh, Hollywood style. Mm-hmm. Because I, I think it probably would be a lot safer to stick with this sort of Western style, simply because even in China, for instance, movies are becoming far more Westernized. Um, you know, we're seeing stuff. You know, big movies now like Independence Day two and um, you know the Transformers movies and you know, stuff like Warcraft. These movies that have come out recently that have just seemed to be doing, they're doing so well in China, and they're very Western based, uh, but they've got this this large, you know, following, and that's sort of something that's, uh, I think it, it's not going to change too much the the way we shoot uh, cinematography. Even though I think in, in if you look do look at some, you know, if you look at from manga for instance or anime um, uh, stuff like that, I think they they're sometimes using um, uh, right to left rather than left to right and so on but I think I mean obviously what I'm teaching here is more western cinematography and I, that's sort of this uh, my school of thought and I, I don't think I'd be very good at teaching the other way so <laughs> you know it's sort of um, just one of those things the safe bet is to do these yeah, rules yeah I, I would I would sort of just uh, err on the side of caution and, and stick to the rules but at least at first you know the cool yeah. thing is you can start to break them um but it's you know it's eventually becoming something that's uh, you get a good feeling of when you should break the rules and if it's actually adding something sort of valuable uh, to your project. Uh, so yeah, another another thing to think about is the sort of character psychology. So this is a, sort of are characters actually facing each other? Are they in a sort of standoff? Like is it a western? Like is it uh, that they're sort of uh, pointing guns at each other, or are they kind of like? Uh, they they sort of they don't they don't care about each other at all. They're kind of one is ignoring the other one. They don't f- really feel like they're um, uh, they're not really relating e- to each other, and that's something that you can get across if you watch any show like Game of Thrones or Mad Men or any of these shows that have you know superb cinematography. This is something that they're thinking about a lot in in every single shot. If there are two characters that aren't seeing eye to eye, you'll find that in the character psychology of the actual shot you'll have it so that they're not making eye contact or that one is in fact just looking away in a completely off, uh, other direction. Uh, so it's just something to think about. Um, framing. So framing is, yes, yeah, th- this is pretty much the... Cr- when you think of cinematography, you immediately think about framing, you immediately think about the rule of thirds and the, uh, you know, how, how we generally frame in, uh, stuff in movies. And the, yes, the reason why is because this is pretty much the the, the very staple uh, for sort of how to, to tell a story. Uh, there's so much you can do in, in framing in, on its own. Um, and your sort of mission as a filmmaker is to sort of use your framing to convey the message. So it's not just that you're simply making some beautiful image. In the end, if you're a cinematic artist or a cinematographer, you really want to be able to use your image to tell the story. Uh, and that's actually just as big a part of, of cinematic art as, uh, as actually just making beautiful looking imagery. Uh, so in a perfect world, you have both. Um, and that's something that you know, someone like Kubrick or uh, Fincher has really mastered the art of doing. Um, so yeah, for this demonstration, I pretty much Threw, t- threw together a quick cave scene with um, it's just like mega scans assets everywhere <laughs> you know just like rocks put all over the place um, and just kind of uh, with a bit of a uh, yeah like a simple idea of these two characters just kind of facing off of each other and uh, you know one one character is crying another one has a gun so you can think about how this kind of fits into could fit into a potential movie script. You know, maybe there's some blood money involved and this guy has chased him to this cave and he's now crying because he's, uh, you know, there with a gun and he's going to kill him. Um, so it's kind of important that you understand what's the dynamic between the two characters before you start thinking about framing or what ch- type of shots you use. Um, and that's really the importance of understanding the cinematic language and all these various shot types that we're going to be going through now uh, and understanding what they convey, why they're used uh, and how they can be used to tell a story. Um, so yes, uh, so 
cinematic shot types, uh, the establishing shot, this is pretty much one of the most used shots uh, you'll see in every single movie pretty much. This is when you uh, establish a scene, you establish a context for the scene, and you show the relationship between important figures and objects. It's generally quite a, a long or extreme long shot. That means it's usually, it's quite wide and it's far back. Uh, so it gets you it gets you to this point where you can see pretty much the layout of the whole scene You know, we're seeing like up here all the um... Oh, yeah, we can see this. Mm -hmm. Oh, the drawing tools. Yes. Oh, I forgot about these. These are amazing So yeah, we can see up here all the cave. We can see this nice light here um, We've got both the characters sort of highlighted there and Everything starts to make sense. We get a whole feeling for the scene uh, we don't have, you know, you obviously can't see what's behind the camera, but you can at least see, in general, every nook and cranny of the scene. You're not going to be uh, sort of questioning, oh, where are we, you know? Whereas, you know, if you'd start upon, for instance, a close-up uh, shot of a character's face, the viewer would have no idea what's going on in the scene around. You know, is that something that's, uh, you know, it, it, where are they? Are they in a cave? Are they uh, in uh, a, a bunker? Are they in some sort of room, nobody knows, until you show some establishing shot. Uh, let's see if I can... Do I know? Extreme long shot. So this is something that's... Uh, it's usually when you have uh, sort of a character or a group of characters that's uh, sort of shown from the front usually. It's uh, really mostly used for sort of like epic views or vistas or panoramas. Uh, it can also be used as an establishing shot. Um, this is really when you want to show, like, you know, for instance, a group of characters walking down the street together. You know, maybe they're all buddies. Mm -hmm. Or in this case, you have, you know, this single guy who is this, like, really powerful uh, center of attention in the image. So he's obviously important. Uh, the long shot's very similar. It's just a little bit uh, pulled in a bit further. You still get a bit of the surrounding environment still gets uh, uh, this sort of uh, importance placed on a single figure, usually. So in these different scenes, is it just the, the distance from the subject that's changing, or is it the distance and the field of view? Both the field of view and you're also usually pulling the camera in a bit further, so it's dollying in, uh, yeah. that means pu pushing in with the actual camera in, in translation. Yeah. Um, and so both, both are used. Um, have actually... Uh, a handout I think we can send around to these guys mm -hmm. that uh, has pretty much lots of the basic rules I think it has also uh, written down all of the the various uh, shot types that I'm going through right now um, and yeah it's really like kind of like a cheat sheet for cinematics uh, which lets you you know just sort of you know, always refer to that when you're setting up a new shot so yeah medium shot now we're getting even closer we're you know leaving the you know the lower lower half of him behind and just showing just concentrating on the upper half. And this is really good when you just want to show like upper body language, uh, facial expressions, and you you know if you're, they're holding something something important, uh, you still get all of that. Medium close-up shot. So this is now getting even closer. We just have the the head. You get some body language, but usually not the the hands. Close-up shot is now, you know, you're cutting off the, the hairline usually, and you're getting uh, very close into the face. You usually leave a bit of space beneath the chin, uh, just to uh, just to give it a bit of breathing room. Um, yeah, it's it's sort of like uh, usually it's it's used with depth of field, so you're not usually getting anything behind the character's head at all. Actually, it's usually quite blurry. So I think it would just even be blurrier than here uh, with a real camera. Um, it's kind of common to sort of move in and out from a close-up. So, you know, you could actually go from this close-up and keep your focal length the same and then, you know, move out to an American shot or, you know, long shot. You can you can do that all in, you know, so all of these you can, you can actually transition between all of these various shot types uh, and that can create quite a cool uh, feeling usually. Uh, so Italian close-up, this is even more extreme, uh, the extreme close-up. 
This is where you sort of tightly frame a person's eyes, and this is really nice when you have that sort of spaghetti western thing going on, where it's like, oh, what's he thinking? Is he he's he's uh, is he kind of determined or is he dodgy or you know if he's got glasses on, it's kind of cool that he's doing something with his eyebrows or his eyes, or that he's wearing some frames. Um, Sorry, I just noticed that there's cry glass in the corner. There. Cry glass. Oh it's yes. Maybe smile. Never yeah. noticed that before. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's it's very it's very uh, specialist cry glass. So. Yeah, yeah. No, this character is not the best one. Uh, I don't know if I can say this, but hopefully we want to get a new SDK character at some point. But we'll see uh, how that goes. Hopefully, it's one that's a bit more a bit more useful than the. Um, uh, the guy we have here, and hopefully a bit more next gen, because this was actually before we had scanned assets, uh, and it's uh, you know it's feeling a bit dated now that you can't really get that close to his eyes without it you know not it doesn't really hold up as well. Um, so yeah, scan, scans are sort of the way to go. Uh, if you look at most next gen games, they're actually uh, usually using some form of scan scanning or scanned photogrammetry even for faces. Um, yeah, so uh, it can also be nice if you have a hat above the character that's creating some kind of a shadow over the eyes or the face, and this just lets the uh, yeah just lets lets you have a bit more mystery there. So again, you think about the story. You know, how is the shot? How is it contributing to the story? Is it a cowboy who's just shown up at a, a the high noon standoff and they're you know uh, they're basically staring each other down? Then you're going to want to have lots of the Italian close-ups. You're going to want to have you know, the American shot, you, you want, want to have the, the gun at their hips kind of stuff. Um, yeah, with the American shot, this was actually another shot that's it's really um, developed for Westerns just because it shows the, the guns and the holsters uh, while still, you know, having the character's expression. So if you watch, the, uh, you know, any um, uh, The Quick and the Dead or um, uh, Good, the Bad and the Ugly or Once Upon a Time in the West, uh, any of those movies... Uh, they're going to have tons of examples of these sort of shots, um, which became pretty much the sort of uh, the basis of Western cinema. Uh, so yeah, high angle shot. Uh, this is pretty much when you want to have uh, someone looking a bit more vulnerable. Uh, it usually makes a character look a bit smaller or a bit like he's not in control. Um, can also be used if you if he's actually looking up at something that's physically much bigger than him. You know, if he's if he's uh, you've won that typical shot of, uh, I think you see this a lot in Spielberg movies. You know, if there's a massive alien spaceship up in the sky or a huge monster, you know, Spielberg will have this moment where all you know, like that War of the Worlds moment where all the characters in the street, you know, Tom Cruise is looking up and he's seeing this massive alien that's kind of rising up, and you get this shot of all the characters in the street looking up and seeing the the monster there, so that's that's another way it can be used. Uh, the opposite to that, of course, is the low angle shot, which is sort of similar to the American, uh, but the camera is actually lower down, uh, looking up at the character. Uh, it usually doesn't include the the wider scene, uh, and again, it's often used depth of field with that. Um, and this is used to really just like emphasize a character's power. So this is something that you'd use if you really want to make it. Uh, feel like they're in a position of power or dominance. It's typically used in like propaganda imagery. Um, so if you, uh, uh, yeah, I mean, if you look at any of the sort of Russian propaganda or uh, the German propaganda from 1940s or so, um, you would you'd find this kind of cinematography was extremely popular back then, and that's where it came from. Uh, so and it's still in use today, actually, in some form. If you look at any of these Marvel superhero movies, it's exactly the same way of framing characters in the sort of propaganda style. Um, so it's really the hero looking towards a bright future, and he's standing on the, um, uh, the, uh, the hill, looking off into the distance. Um, it also can be used for villains as well. You know, your villain can also be shot from a low angle to make him appear a bit more sinister. Um, this is something that's usually just a case of, you know, if, you, if you're uh, lighting the scene in a dark way or if you're putting in, for instance, more uh, red tones or green or something like that, it's usually the lighting is, is good or evil. Even in Hollywood movies now, you'd get this with, like, a, 
good it's a good example of like Star Trek, uh, the 2009 movie. You know, you have the Enterprise where everything's like an iPad. You know, everything's Apple Apple iPod lit lighting, and then you go to the enemy ship, and everything's green and yellow. And you know, Nero's ship is just uh, this uh, disgusting, uh, evil place. So Hollywood still does this, <laughs> the old tricks. You know. Uh, bird's eye view, so this is really, yeah, this is pretty much your drone camera, your CTT, CCTV camera. Uh, it's taken from directly above the scene, and you can use it to sort of establish the landscape and layout, uh, and how the actors are in relation to each other. Uh, it's also, you can use that to have a sense of uh, being watched, you know, maybe there's a CCTV that's actually watching them, or a drone camera that's actually watching them for above. Uh, you can use that sort of intercut their, you know, that paranoia uh, back and forth between, you know, if you have a close-up of their face and then you're going back to the CCTV and then another close-up of, the, of their face again, it's getting that feeling of, oh, they're being watched. Uh, the worm's eye view, this is when you're sort of looking at characters from below and it makes them seem super intimidating and super mighty, you know, like they are in control. The most famous use of that was in Reservoir Dogs when you know, there's something in the back of this case. It's obviously like there's a guy in there, in the back of the, the car, uh, and they're all, you know, these super powerful criminals that have complete control over this situation, and you are completely powerless because they, they're in full control of everything, or at least at that point in the movie, you think they're in control of everything. Um, so yeah, it's one, one of the ways you can, you can kind of uh, use cinematography just to to tell that story. Uh, the two shot, this is something that's, uh, yeah, usually just two characters together in the same shot. They're um, usually having some kind of uh, interaction, so it's like one guy will go like to the other guy, and then the other guy will go like, okay, I'll do that. Uh, if, if you want to have some kind of, you can even have the, the guy behind is like talking while the other one is kind of acknowledging. In this way, you, it's something that Spielberg uses a lot where you can have for instance, one character that's delivering the line, and then you will get the other character's reaction on his face as the as the character delivers that line. So it's just it's just that feeling of emotion on on the the uh, primary character's face. It reminds me of a couple of scenes from Bad Boys. Mm. You know, the bubblegum scene, and then yep. the the scene where the guy's coming to pick his daughter up from the prom. You've got that kind of duo of yep, characters yep. and the, the mix of emotions. It's that hero sidekick kind yeah, of thing, yeah, you know? yeah. And it's really cool because you can, yeah, you can do so much with that, uh, just to, you know, just in conveying how they, how they sort of feel um, between each other. Uh, it's even stuff like big action movies like Avatar and stuff like that, you know, they're using that kind of shot all the time uh, just, just to get across. Anytime you have an interaction between two characters, it's usually a two shot of some kind. Um, and the other interesting thing is it's, it's also can be quite similar to if you have, for instance, close-up shots uh, where you'd go from a close-up of one person's face to a close-up of another person's face and, you know, you, you have the axis rule so it's, it's always like that, you know, you're, you're never crossing the line. Uh, and then you'd have, you know, maybe you have the, the sound of somebody talking but then what you're actually cutting to is the person's reaction in their face rather than you're showing someone talking and you're seeing them on the screen talking and then you're showing someone else talking and you're seeing them on the screen talking. So you've got that feeling of like, oh, now now we're actually only watching the characters' reactions. That's something else uh, Spielberg's doing a lot. Um, and yeah, I think it, it, it's quite a cool technique. Uh, so the canter shot, or I don't actually ever call it the canter shot. I usually call it the Dutch angle. Um, just because it's, I think that sounds coolest, but it can also be called the German angle or cantered shot. Uh, this is pretty much just where you're tilting the camera, uh, you know, not this much usually, a bit to the left or the right. Uh, is again just something you can use to um, show power um, in a in a character or weakness. It's really something with a higher power is usually higher in the frame, whereas something that's lower in the frame is is not as powerful. Um, so it can be used in a number of situations. Uh, one is where, where, for instance, you have like an uphill battle where you have actually a hero character that's fighting this great battle and he has to run up a hill. You're, you're trying to make it seem like the scene is literally fighting against him and he's got to you know, really 
get up that hill just to just to be able to continue. You know, even if it's a completely flat scene, you can still tilt the camera to make it feel harder for the protagonists. Um, so all kinds of tricks you can use to do that. Um, yeah, getting into more, more detailed shots. The the detailed shot. This is where you have um, a certain item or body part that you show very very close. Uh, and it's usually something that you can can be kind of nervous fidgeting. So like tapping on a desk or like drumming on a desk, um, or a figure on the trigger of a gun ready to fire, or sort of uh, you know character just reaching into his pocket. You know maybe he's he's you know reaches for some something that's important to the story somehow, some glasses or so or so. Uh, and you then would go from a close up of the character or you know American shot to that direct detail shot of them pulling something out uh, and and moving it. Uh, so usually something very, uh, very sort of integral to the scene. You wouldn't usually give an entire shot just to, uh, you know, just for something insignificant. It's usually something very significant to the plot or whatever is going to sort of happen next. So it could be, for instance, a character's holding like the detonator switch of a bomb. Uh, I think there's like, yeah, good example. Like, I think in Return of the Jedi or so, like. Um, Princess Leia has, uh, when, you know, she's in disguise and she's dressed up and she's holding this bomb and she's ready to kill Jabba and she's, you know, you always get that, that, uh, he, she's holding a thermal detonator, that kind of thing, you know, and it's, it's like that obvious moment where you have the, oh, the finger is on the button of that, that detonator and if she lets go it's gonna blow up the entire, um, scene. So yeah, you definitely have to have some reason for doing the detailed shots. Um... So yeah, I mean, the thing with all of these sort of cinematic shot types is you have to understand what they're for, how you can use them, how you can put them together. So it's really about, you know, it's, it's a bit like a Lego, you know, a Lego set. You've got all the bricks, you know what they can be used for, but it's up to you how you put those, uh, those together and what you're trying to convey. Which is why having a script is sort of paramount. Having a script is paramount before you go into even the blocking out stage. You need to understand what you're trying to achieve uh, and sort of con convert that initial idea into cinematography. Um, and once, it, once you get to that point, you're at this fairly safe place where you can uh, show that to a director, show your block out to a director and hopefully get that approved before you go on to the next step, which is actually polishing uh, your shots and refining your compositions and uh, your framing and your uh, uh, your various uh, lighting and post effects and so on. Um, so uh, yeah, cinematic composition, I think we are almost, yeah a few more shots here of the different ways you can get that across, that's like high and mighty, low and insignificant um, so it depends what your story is really. Um, so yeah, more about sort of cinematic composition and this is sort of getting into the nitty-gritty of once you have your, you know, you, you know what sort of shot you want to pull off. Uh, you know, for instance, if you're, you're doing a close-up shot um, like this one and, and you really, you want to get the most out of that close-up, what are the sort of, uh, what are the sort of visual um, features that you can use to make sure that shot looks as good as possible. Um, so yeah, just go through the basics uh, like depth of field uh, or the rule of thirds, um, which pretty much when when people start um, when people start with cinematics, they're pretty much going immediately to the uh, the very basic knowledge, which of course is uh, your rule of thirds or your golden ratio, uh, which is of course the idea that you're uh, you split the screen into three th uh, into two into two thirds. And the middle section is uh, usually where you would have your characters framed. So down here we have the little starfish framed in the bottom left third. Uh, but any can work. You can have him in the, uh, the right lower third or the upper right third or uh, upper left third. Um, it really boils down to how is your staging in your scene. And that's again going back to the axis rule, the 180 degree rule. How is that set up with that half circle? Uh, should you be framing stuff on the left? Should you be framing stuff on the right? So that's something you need to know before you start uh, actually thinking about your composition. You need to understand what the story is you're going to tell. Uh, but once you do, it helps to remember the rule of thirds. Um, it's a really simple trick. If you are just making a single image, 
The rule of thirds usually will improve your composition twentyfold just by following it. Um, and it can work in pretty much any situation. So like establishing shots, for instance, you know, you've got the shot here of the Eiffel Tower. Uh, and just by offsetting this, you, know, you could imagine here how the shot would look if you cut this down and you would just have uh, a shot like this, for instance. Um, yeah, and it's it's just boring, you know. That's not a very good. Uh, it's not a very good line there. But I'm drawing with a mouse, so that's my excuse. <laughs> but uh, yeah, if you centralize things, they don't look so great. That's my point. And it's just this. Um, it's just this weird situation. Yeah, I'm never going to draw a very good line here. <laughs> I wonder if there is like a nice tool for this. I don't think so. <laughs> Maybe if you hold down shift, it'll do two it'll straight line between two points. Mm. This is why I went to, into cinematics instead of drawing. <laughs> that was a good choice. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, so usually it's really it's really boring if you frame everything central. Um, but in some cases, it can be quite cool. What is definitely something you should avoid is, of course, framing something way, way, way to the you know this side of the screen, and it's just here for some reason, or it's you know it's in a really odd position somewhere that's not quite uh, central. It's not quite in the third. It's just a bit of you don't know what it is you're trying to tell basically. Um, so in composition, a lot of it is down to did you put it there for a reason? If you didn't think, hmm, is this building in the distance here in that third for a reason, then you should sort of reconsider, oh, maybe I should move that to there, or I should try and frame it there. You know, as this is a real photo, but as it happens, both of the main elements match up nicely with the thirds. Um, maybe that's just luck, maybe it's uh, the photographer spent a day trying to figure out how to get that to work. Who knows? Uh, but in the end, the result is nice, and that's all that really matters. Uh, let's go to the next one. Oh, normal mode. Ah, here you go. Uh, so again, here, something with this bridge. Um, usually, you get this situation where at least something is is framed there. What's interesting in this example is the actual vanishing point. Vanishing point of the image is in the third as well. Uh, so this means that all the lines are kind of leading into that one uh, third there, and it sort of uh, helps helps your eye get drawn to that uh, that focal point of the image. Um, and the cool thing with this is sort of uh, it enhances the the readability. It kind of gives some order to the image, uh, and we kind of like that sense of order. So. Real life, of course, it, it's not really like good photography. In real life, everything's a bit of a mess. Uh, you know, if you look at the real world, you can you you walk outside some days and you'll just think like, this isn't that great. Everything looks super detailed and very realistic because it's real, but it doesn't necessarily look good. So there's that difference between it looking like real life and it looking good. So. You need you need to still think about sort of good photography uh, and how we can make things look pleasant, which is sort of the um, uh, yeah presentation effect really. Um, so yeah, faces. Um, so I, I sort of normal everyday world is this kind of chaos, uh, and our sort of senses uh, kind of evolved to allow us to sort of survive in the wilderness and how to sort of recognize certain patterns. So like the human face or like a hand, uh, when there's a face in the image, or especially like eyes, we're definitely immediately drawn to those rather than anything else. You know, immediately you're looking at the character's eyes. So it's, it's really something that you can use to get people's attention and communicate some sort of uh, importance. Uh, so like this Italian shot here is like, oh wow, you know, this is, super important shot because it shows exactly what this guy is thinking you know is he ready to draw his gun is he you know it's it's giving you immediately a, a communication about what's happening next in the story another cool technique of course is centralization which Kubrick used a lot um, this is this is one of the techniques where you can have uh, characters that's completely central and all leading lines going straight into the center of the I'll do this somehow with the web. The center of the image. Yeah. <laughs> I try and ma match things up. 
uh, to get so that everything is is focused on one point. Um, another another filmmaker that uses this a lot is uh, uh, Guillermo del Toro. Am I right? How do you pronounce that guy's name? Guillermo del Toro. Yeah, <laughs> that del Toro guy. That del Toro guy. I don't know how to actually pronounce his name, but he makes great movies. Um, yeah, Kubrick again, and a few examples from Kubrick. That's the that's Full Metal Jacket. Uh, great film and The Shining also a great film Kubrick didn't really ever make any bad films um, this is random thing from Google Images uh, no. so this is this is more about uh, frames within frames um, which is where you get something for instance like a, yeah, an archway or a doorway or, some, or something to basically go around your character or your focal point uh, to highlight their importance even more, and usually you have this—they have this super contrast around the uh, uh, the character, and yeah, it's it's frames within frames. So there can be a, a number of different ways you can do this. Uh, Fincher uses this a lot. Uh, this is a shot from Fight Club, the very ending of Fight Club, very instantly recognizable shot. Of course, most people know this, um, but yeah, even here you have both characters nicely framed, and then also each one framed within the frame. And they're even making this nice heart shape here between them, which maybe is a, an accident, but it's a happy accident, I think, maybe. Um, but it's definitely very intentional framing and composition in this shot. Um, sort of to represent that they're both kind of, you know, moving on together in their, with their lives, finally, after this crazy <laughs> thing that happened to them. Best film ever. Best film ever. It's not the best film ever. The best film ever is uh, Gattaca. We've got to be careful now because we could go along like Fight Club versus your uh, your inferior opinion mm. for a while. No. <laughs> I, like, I think Fight Club is definitely in my top ten. It's cool. very it's a very cool movie. Um, great cinematography, uh, awesome scripts. Yeah, really cool. Um, but yeah, I think like Gattaca, Contact, Full Metal Jacket. Contact. I'm, thinking, I'm yeah. thinking like Contact is a great film uh, really amazing um, Back to the Future 2 <laughs> that's, that's, just, that's just pandering that is I think <laughs> I love Back to the Future 2 um, <laughs> yeah those movies hold up so well they, they're never going to get old uh, yeah so cropping uh, this is a very easy mistake to make uh, where you could potentially uh completely ruin an already perfect looking shot simply by cropping it incorrectly. Uh, so these are the general rules of cropping. It's usually not to chop off anyone's uh, top of their head uh, unless it is very uh, intentionally done at their hairline or, or the middle of their forehead for a close-up for instance. Uh, not to chop off uh, sort of the sides of their ears. It's like you can, you can basically just chop off the top of the very top of their head, but nothing like the sides of their face like this. You don't want to end up in a situation where your, your character's ear is missing off the frame. Um, the uh, uh, the neck is usually okay to crop off, uh, crop to. So basically, any of these green markers uh, will help you there. Usually, it's best to avoid any joints. So anywhere where it's like the uh, hand is somehow missing and just the hand <laughs> something like that so usually it's good to just uh, to take a look at your uh, digital camera references you know if you look up any online photography uh, intros or uh, first uh, it's really the first thing you learn with any photography is just how your cropping should work um, I think I included this one in the, the handout so good to look at um, Another thing that's interesting is uh, and usually something that people don't really attribute to uh, cinematography but more to design, but I think it, it really helps a lot to understand or at least think about this concept, uh, which is of detail levels. Um, so you can see here how we kind of break out down how an object is detailed. Um, it's, you know, this is usually something that designers learn, uh, but it, I think it works really nicely for cinematography and it's actually helped me a lot with design stuff you know just because once you've underst you understand that's how detail works uh, you can really go crazy with it uh, so yeah it's very basic level you have something like a basic object with just 
boxes and very flat shaded sides. And then you can take that to the next level and you've kind of added these, uh, these sort of secondary details where everything's more rounded, you've got the, the general shapes. And, you know, some modelers would even stop there and they would be like, okay, I've modeled this weird pipe thing now. And it's, I uh, actually have no idea what this is. Uh, it could be anything. It looks like some sort of robotic pipe system. Um, something from the Matrix. It's something from the Matrix, yeah. It looks like generic science fiction stuff and it looks really cool. So yeah, most, most modelers, or not most, but you know, some modelers would even stop here and they'd be happy with that 3D model and some, you know, some it's pretty much good enough. Uh, but you can, of course, take this further without making your uh, asset any less, uh, without making your asset sort of inferior. You're actually improving it and adding more of this sort of photorealism. So for anything that's more like photorealism, usually you'd have this situation where you have lots and lots of extra details that are coming in, but they're coming in at a certain percentage. So it's not just like we add details everywhere. We're just adding the details to say 20% of each surface. So here you've kind of got, you know, if you look at these wires here between the third and the fourth read, they're getting now a little bit of extra detail, but only on about say 10 or 15% of it. Uh, it's almost like this periodic detail. Uh, if you look at the uh, the pipes here, they're kind of left alone because they're a place where the viewer can kind of just look at that area and relax the eye. Whereas if you would if you'd have detail, for instance, as much detail as, as this area here, let me draw on there a little. If we had this much this area of detail all the way, you know, throughout the image, if that was here, if that was here the viewer would have nowhere to rest their eyes and you'd end up with this situation where it's just a mess of, uh, you know, you don't know what to look at. It's super detailed, but it's just not really, uh, it's not really fun to look at. It's not beautiful. Um, whereas, you know, you've got the other level, which is just no detail at all. It's going to look like 3D stuff. It's going to be just way, uh, way too basic. So it helps, uh, of course, to think about that. Of course, you can have some designs which are completely non-detailed, but they're usually getting away with that because they have really nice shapes, for instance, or uh, really solid uh, lighting and rendering. Um, but yeah, if you want to approach photorealism with sort of hard surface models or something, this is something you need to look at. And if you want to do this, you can actually apply the same thing to cinematography. Um, if you're going to do a, a, any kind of render of a real nature scene, You've got to make sure you have some elements that are, you know, 20% of the image is, is super detailed and the other 80%, you know, it's, it's getting then periodically less detailed to this point where that maybe another half of it is stuff where you can rest your eye on these very nice, even areas. Um, so yeah, that's a perfect example of the, in the real world of, of how that can work. Uh, if you've got the very super detailed central part of this flower uh, to then this now slightly detailed area on the on the, the petals to then this huge blurry void for most of the image of yeah bokeh de depth of field which is uh which is helping you to it just draws your eye to just the detailed area and there's a lot of area here and the rest of the image for the eye to rest so you're not distracted and it's not it's not overly confusing. And this is sort of getting to that um, understanding minimalism uh, and that minimalism is not just simply not having very much stuff in the scene, but it's really about thinking how a percentage of detail is broken down. You know, so it's that 10% here for the center of that, and then that may be 20% for the petals, and then the rest is, you know, 70% is this blurry, uh, yeah, this blurry, not very detailed part that lets the eye rest. So if you think about how you can break your images down that way, it can usually help a lot. Uh, yeah, depth of field as well is a super valuable tool for, tool for this because it lets you uh, yeah, control the detail level even more within an image. So you can have a hyper detailed foregr uh, foreground object and then the background, you can decide what level of detail that should be. Ooh. Another thing that's cool is motion blur. Motion blur can also be used to, uh, it obviously conveys speed, obviously conveys movement, but it can also help to reduce detail in certain areas. So 
you could have, for instance, uh, an object that's um, the background is completely moving way, way quicker. You know, you've got the road whizzing by the car, and um, the car is perfectly in focus and uh, and very crisp, and the background is is completely. Uh, blurred like here this picture of a cheetah you've got the cheetah is very much detailed the background is whizzing by conveys that speed and it's just a different way of breaking up again uh, the detail levels um, that sort of second read third read fourth read primary secondary tertiary detail um, just something to think about when constructing images um, another thing of course is uh, silhouettes Silhouettes are super important. These let you pretty much understand uh, characters and shapes. So it allows you to come up with very interesting shapes and designs and also uh, pick out human figures from the image. So if you were to, you know, if I were to have this, this rock here, the same uh, color as the background, you know, this rock had the same color as, uh, and the background had the same color as this rock, you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between the rock and this uh, the human figure there, if, you know, Tom Cruise standing against this waterfall. That waterfall is placed by the artists, uh, by the designer. It's by design that that waterfall is there because it brings this white background so that you have that silhouette popping immediately. Uh, and this, per this, this mist here is also has the same purpose to allow that ship there, that nice pop against the background of the silhouette. Um, so that's something that it's, it's nicely considered and, and sort of carefully thought through. Uh, again, same thing here, yeah, 300. Using silhouettes all the time. Uh, sort of Zack Snyder's uh, typical uh, cinematography, which I kind of like in some ways. In, in some ways it's a bit overdone, but um, you have to make your own mind. There's definitely no... I've got no arguments with saying that it's definitely beautiful imagery. That's really nice. Um, of course, the bigger criticism about his films is that the, maybe the story is lacking a bit. In 300, I, I would say I enjoyed it, though. So I was 16 when I watched it, though, so it's maybe not such a great... Probably should go back and watch that one again. And well, I went out. to watch it at IMAX in 3D just because I wanted to see people's legs fall off in 3D, which... Oh. That many years ago was a was you know before VR before stereoscopy was a main thing that was cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was worth the extra money for the IMAX. Extra violence levels. Yes. Yeah, that's always good. Um, yeah, I mean violence. I, I think I I worked so much on on shooters. Uh, I, I kind of became bored of violence eventually, and I was just like, okay, now I have to just I have to take a step back and realize this isn't isn't great. I want to do mega scan leaves now. No mm. shooting and killing. Yeah, leaves and little cuddly uh, stuff and like yeah. nothing crazy. Um, but where nobody dies. I, I think it was also Germany was a big impact for that as well because they kept. Uh, if I said that I worked at a video games company, they'd say that I worked in Killerspiele. Oh yes, <laughs> killer games. Killer games. So it's not very popular to work in Killerspiele in Germany. Um, you have to you have to watch yourself there when you're in a, a bar talking to a bunch of Germans and they think you work on uh, something really gory. Um, so yeah, this is all mostly about the silhouettes and uh, it's also interesting to note the you know how they're using color grading in, in 300 and stuff. They're really going crazy with crushing the black levels down, amping up all of the highlights, uh, but. They do it in such a way that it still keeps some sort of a balance there. So, uh, but it's in stark contrast to some of the movies from, you know, for instance, back in the 80s. Before they had uh, digital color grading, everything was done uh, with pretty much in the lighting. So, you know, you'd still have that typical thing of you know blue and yellow lights and uh, these these sort of uh, trying to create teal and orange. Um, which we've got in modern movies, but it's kind of a digital effect now. And it's something that I think a lot of people complain is usually a bit overdone. If you watch the Transformers movies, for instance, you know, you've got almost these orange skin tones and they're just completely unrealistic. Uh, and then you've got, you know, like in this example, for instance, everywhere, you know, the whole scene is completely green. Um, yeah, which is fine. It's it's not too it's not such a bad example. I think it works quite well here. The Matrix filter. Um, but yeah, it's the Matrix filter. Um, and, and yeah, it, the, the sort of theory behind that is that teal and orange uh, are generally really pleasant colors to look at. Uh, and, you know, for, you know, sort of industrial stuff or sort of, um, 
uh, background scenes or environments, teal is a really nice color for that. And then the flesh tones are usually this orange, which makes your uh, faces pop against the background better. Um, I, arguably it does work. I think some movies do re use it really nicely, um, but some of course abuse this in a, in a way. And it, it kind of comes down to that sort of uh, magic bullet looks kind of thing. You know, you, you get these really nice color grades that are presets and you just throw them on top of an image. And sometimes it works really nicely, but other times it's just, uh, you're avoiding doing the hard work of coming up with a sort of look uh, of your own. Um, yeah, Starship Troopers. Starship Troopers actually has some really nice cinematography. Um, it's Paul Verhoeven, a great director, um, great visual style, really cool designs. Uh, so this is an example of uh, sort of a monochromatic color scheme, uh, and it's interesting because it's you know it's all very earthy colors, uh, but you've still got this nice uh, pop and contrast with the skin tones and the uh, the environment and the, their clothes. So the environment and their clothes kind of mesh together quite well, but then the skin tone's still popping out and everyone's kind of, it's still nice to look at, you know. Another cool example of this is from uh, James Bond, promo promotional stuff for James Bond. I can't remember if there was actually ever any scenes in the movie like this, but yeah, it's cool promotional shots uh, where, you know, it's everything else in the scene is silver, you know, sil sil silver car, gray suits, gray and white for everything else in the scene except just the, you know, even the hand, they tried to remove a bit of the skin tone there. So it's just his head that's really the center, you know, and it's, it's what he's got on his, you know, his, his expression on his face. And it just looks really, in the end, really cool and refined uh, style, actually. Um, so they obviously thought about the colors there. You know, if somebody would walk in with a big red, <laughs> you know, like a uh, beach ball or something, it would ruin the shot. So <laughs> you say ruin? <laughs> maybe, I, I think you meant improve. Maybe it would improve. But not, I don't know. I, I would say it's it's maybe something that if very carefully considered for this marketing campaign, uh, just just how how they grade everything and how it how it comes across there. So yeah, really refined visual style there. Um, and yes, before they had uh, digital color grading, um, great directors like James Cameron, they were able to already pull off very nice. Uh, analog lighting and grading which uh, I th in some ways looks better than some of the movies from today uh, in, in, for instance here in Aliens they had to of course create you know they had real lights that were actually teal lights you can see the actual teal on her, uh, her skin there you can see the uh, real reflections going on in the scene you can see they even designed the background panels in the scene to have the correct color and this is before digital color grading, so it's really not something that they could have gone in and corrected afterwards. They had to make sure that all of the costumes and all of the sets were designed that way, uh, that all the colors would mesh nicely when it's put to final film. Um, so yeah, the brown jackets and the green clothes uh, in you know complementary colors to the the teal on the uh, sorry to the uh, uh, orangish skin tones or you know peach peach skin tone is. Uh, yeah, it works really nicely. Uh, so obviously something they think about a lot uh, before they shoot scenes and while they're assembling sets. Um, yeah, another cool feature, of course, aer aerial perspective or just fog. Um, this is usually a way you can create cool silhouettes uh, and while still having a very natural look. Uh, this is something you can use to have uh, sort of break out and create layers in the image. Uh, make things look much, much bigger than they really are. It gives everything a big sense of perspective and scale. Um, so yeah, here again, different examples, more of a Blade Runner concept art style. Uh, was it Cyberpunk? I guess Cyberpunk. Yeah. Or Neo Tokyo uh, kind of uh, style there. And you, so you can use the aerial perspective in lots of different, uh, lots of different ways. Uh, just brings that layers of depth into your shots into your concepts or your imagery. Uh, another cool fi uh, feature, rim lighting. This is where you place like a light. You really want to get a light right behind an actor or an object and it just hits the side of their uh, silhouette. Uh, and it just brings out the silhouette there. You can combine that then with you know fill lights and other forms of lighting. Um, or you can go for a, of course, really 
obvious example here, like this art, art house style, where it's just the silhouettes there or something like that. Uh, but usually this is a component of, uh, just one component in a greater visual uh, lighting scheme, uh, where you have, you know, for instance, these horses where there's actually a rim light that's hitting all of the tops of the horses, and then you've got, of course, some environmental lighting or, you know, I guess, fill lighting, uh, just to, to bring up the uh, contrast there. The other way that the lighting is quite interesting here is that there's a bit of fog and that is of course bringing in the depth so you've kind of got that combined all three of those uh, different techniques so just a uh, you know, various like fill lighting, rim lighting, uh, aerial perspective um, and it's also monochromatic as well if you want to look at it that way um, just to bring out that, that feeling. Um, Spielberg used this uh, to really good effect in uh, Schindler's List and it is in a way it's really interesting because this is the film where it was not just used as a visual style it was a whole movie was shot uh, in, in grayscale and black and white um, but it was actually used really to tell the story which was some something that was really one of the most interesting scenes in cinema where you have the scene of the, the little girl dressed in red and she's in this world of gray and she's walking through the street and all of this hectic uh, chaos is happening around her uh, and this monochromatic color scheme with just her being red is used to that to, to actually tell that story uh, and to uh, sort of bring it all together so you can see that if you do a perfect job of composition and lighting and cinematography as well as your story and you bring all of that together you can really create something uh, that change, you know, it sort of changes people's minds or really conveys uh, the story that you're trying to tell in a way that's way more powerful than if you hadn't, for instance, spent a lot of time thinking about how your composition and your lighting and uh, cinematography can actually be used to tell that story. So it's a very powerful tool. Uh, it's a tool that you know great filmmakers in Hollywood have used, uh, but also you know. Some pretty terrible filmmaking filmmaking has been done with it as well. You know, propaganda movies, um, the Triumph of the Will. You know, it's there are all kinds of great things you can do with it, but it's a tool like any other. Um, so, it's one of those things that's uh, it's very interesting to think about the history of cinematography, and it's something that's got a great history actually of 100 years of filmmaking. Um, so, yeah, it's something to bear in mind as well. Um, everything can come together in the end to tell a perfect story through composition, lighting, script writing, and so on. Um, hey. So yeah, creating cinematic shots in CryEngine. Uh, I have a few different t uh, examples of this stuff. Um, yeah, so for instance here's one I was creating for um, uh, Robinson the Journey screenshot just for uh, promotional stuff. Uh, yeah, it just uses, of course, some of the rules. I have the, the rule of thirds going here. Uh, I have this uh, kind of complementary color scheme of this orange with this uh, sort of blue, a uh, bit of teal. Uh, and, you know, of course, this is not accident stuff. You know, it's uh, a bit inspired by the level, how level lighting looks. And then it's, of course, moved across into, like, how can we get the level lighting and make that pop even more? How can we... Uh, get the colors to mesh even better uh, how can we place uh, um, how can we place our actors and uh, in the sort of optimal place uh, optimal features um, for those to work uh, also got this bit of fog on the bottom for a bit of depth and aerial uh, sort of a bit of aerial perspective um, you can also see the difference in values between the, the foreground actors they're much darker than uh, the darkest part of the background here Yeah, here is more more like silhouettes, so intentionally very bright white background. Um, I t kind of take that that detail thing again. You know, you've got this quite uh, blurry sky, but then it's very much detailed tree and detailed grass. But really, it's the the tree details that are kind of taking up most of the detail there. Um, so it's kind of breaking bro broken down into these three different areas. You've got the grass, you've got the tree, you've got the sky. Um, here is the same thing. You've got sort of th three elements. You've kind of got the dark leaves, the bright white, uh, the bright light leaves, 
and then you've got the background here, this kind of blurry uh, back backing here. So it's kind of about separating the image into these three different components, three levels of detail, or, or even four. Um, you know, thinking about how how the space is used uh, in your composition. So I'm sort of hand placing the leaves uh, manually just to get those into that position where uh, some of the screen is taken up uh, and other parts are kind of uh, not taken up at all. So that's the negative space. Uh, so thinking about how how this, uh, you know, if I would paint all this background here black, you'd be able to see that there's you know, certain leaves that are uh, intentionally placed there in certain areas. And all of these scenes here, lighting, are done in engine, running in real yeah, time, yeah. effectively. Yeah, I mean, it, there's very, it's there's not really much, it, there's no magic there. It's really just down to uh, tweaking the sun and the fog until you get this uh, decent. Uh, light direction and then it's a case of going in and uh, tweaking C vars and lighting until it looks uh, how you want it to look so for instance if shadows aren't really holding up at the resolution you'd like try turning up the shadows see if you can get that to look good without it looking too glitchy you're gonna show us how to do that soon right and uh, yeah and uh, yeah the same with lights as well just the um, uh, radius uh, of lights and uh, different ones. Actually, these scenes I had really just one sunlight, so I don't know how we did for time. I can't see because it's down here. An hour and six. Oh, okay, that's okay. Um, yeah, and this was this was something something of a personal project, just uh, designed for a, a landing capsule. So yeah, again, thinking a bit like how we break up an object. You know, if you have this basic object here. How do we take this white area and then that's like taking up maybe you know, three quarters of it and then you've got this area down here that's super reflective. Um, probably I'll even add more details to this later uh, but you can already see that it's like once you've got basic shapes in there if you get those basic shapes to uh, have uh, various levels of detail in different areas uh, it's already going to look fairly good. Yeah, same thing here. I've got this uh, more white mountain stuff for the sky, and then it's you know in contrast with the basically half of the image completely covered in these foreground rocks. Um, both have kind of detail, but it's a different kind of detail. Um, so it allows you to kind of separate the two by eye, uh, and but at the same time it's it's merging together in a way. So can help a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, here the same thing. I think a lot about just how how I lay out my images that it's negative space and it's you know perfectly chopped in half, but then it's uh, something along the sky is there. Um, yeah, and it's it's really just having that situation where you're uh, yeah, you're thinking about where are the rocks placed, where where's the viewers are going to be drawn, what's their attention going to be drawn to. Um, and so like sky is not really so detailed, this rock is maybe medium detail, and then you've got this very very close foreground rocks that are sort of the highest level of detail. Oh yeah, this is it. Oh cool. Um, <laughs> so I'm going to switch to Cry Engine now. Um, so if I can get this all in soon. So yeah, I think this is what we were up to last time. Mm -hmm. I think that's. I don't know if this is going to play back at a decent speed, but we'll see. It will in the VOD. That's the main thing. Okay, cool. Yeah. Um, so yeah, we we got to this situation where we just had this nice little fly camera just going through the scene. Um, I think what I'll do is I'll try to uh, go through some of the functions I used in using CryEngine in terms of lighting, uh, just to. Yeah, I'm sort of go through uh, lighting and uh, cameras, how we're setting up uh, the depth of field, uh, and so on. So, I think I'll start and just put in a new camera from the camera menu there. You just actually can go any at any point. You can always go up to here and hit camera, create new camera from current view, and then uh, that will actually create a camera exactly on the spot. Where you wanted to, uh, you you want a new camera, uh, and then you can go on this camera menu here, camera entity, and hit camera two, 
Uh, then I think I'll just go fly around with this camera by adding it to track view. And selected. Oh yeah, you can hit select current camera from here. Well, you can just grab it from the level explorer if you know what it's called, yeah? Yeah, yeah, you can just, uh, I think you can just... Oh, no. Don't, don't, don't no, go crazy. No, don't dragon crazy. drop. <laughs> dragon drop is not there yet. Not there yet. Uh, one day we'll have an, a nice dragon drop from, from here to here, but we're not quite there. Um, so yeah, if you hit this record function, you can then... Uh, you have to actually unlock the camera movement here from the camera menu. And once you've done that, you've actually got control over the camera. Uh, and so what I'll try and do is find a nice area uh, to film from. Uh, I'm going to just add a key at the beginning there for field of view. And usually in my scenes I try to make the field of view very low. So maybe even something like 15, something like that. Uh, just because that way it's very... Uh, it's, it's actually most film cameras are using something like 10 or 15. You know, if you look up, uh, there's actually, a, I think in my cheat sheet, I have a list of the FOVs uh, from the game translated into real world FOVs or, you know, vice versa. Uh, the real world FOVs of, for instance, like a 50 millimeter camera, uh, sorry, 50 millimeter lens or a 35 millimeter lens translated into the game FOV uh, and just how that looks. And, and, you know, it's usually actually field of view values of you know, like 10 to 15, it's even lower actually sometimes, so like 7 f f FOV, so much lower than you'd actually think. Um, so that's one way you can really add some realism to your shots and make it look more movie-like, is just lowering FOV down. Uh, and I think it's one big, I think quite a big mistake that newcomers make is that they're usually, um, yeah, usually not, not doing that. They're usually still having like a 60 frame, uh, sorry, 60 FOV uh, camera. Uh, so okay, we have something like this where the yeah, it's creating a nice negative space. I think roughly uh, we have the tree there. We can kind of move around and uh, what I usually do is you know once I have the placement kind of right, I can kind of go in and like figure out exactly how is how is the negative space working. You know, do I want some more of a gap there or? exactly you know exactly what's going to help the image I think what is quite nice in this one is this rock but I think actually it's a bit too far it's a bit too centralized so just maybe move that a bit to the, the left to do that I usually just I either go in and do uh, the uh, uh, record function or I can just directly modify the keys so that's frame it like something like this um, in the camera settings, I can change this fuzzy setting here uh, to make that even even uh, more massive, that we can see everything in the distance. Uh, this is something you can just amp up really, really far. Uh, I think in Robinson we're mostly having like hundred thousand uh, uh, fuzzy clipping. So in CryEngine you can really go crazy with that. There's just no, uh, there's not really a limit to it. Make sure I turn off the record function before I do anything. Mm -hmm. um, I have these big background planes, but I think what I'll do in this shot is just uh, yeah, these are just uh, massive planes. And in this one, I'm just going to turn off the ocean, and then I think I'll move this down a bit. Yeah, so you can see the um, background there. <laughs> and then I usually am just making stuff for the for the shot directly, so. Usually they're working in the camera, and you can see I'm always just going back to the camera and seeing how it looks there. Um, so yeah, something like this is really nice to kind of start from. Yeah, I I, I should be using brushes technically, but I'm I'm just using geometries because I like the little gizmos. Yeah. So the question, just for the, the purpose of the VOD, is any specific reason why you're using geometries for all the entities instead of brushes? Brushes are cheaper regarding the rendering performance, aren't they? Yes, but you're speaking to a cinematic artist here that doesn't care about real time. 
Yeah. So <laughs> as long as it looks well, pretty. I, if I would make the scene for mobile, uh, yeah, we would just place everything brush. Uh, but there's also a handy function. You can just convert straight to uh, brushes, um, which is very simple and easy. You just go to, uh, uh, where is it again? Uh, new layout. <laughs> Yes. Yeah, there is a there is a way you can do this. Um, At least there used to be. <laughs> um, we'll see. One second. Hmm. It's probably been removed somewhere to like under tools or something like that, and then yeah. maybe deprecated or, or something like that. Yeah, there was definitely a, a shelf before that we could actually directly convert. Um, Perhaps it's under right click on level, level explorer now, you could right click it and. Uh, mm, could be. The one you've got, like right click and convert to. Mm -hmm. Transform. Oops. <laughs> Just clicking random stuff. Uh, it's yeah. somewhere. <laughs> yeah, we get back to you about that one. <laughs> yes, uh, not when exactly we, sure where it's the answer, I'll add it to the forum thread. Okay, cool. Um, yeah, it, and yes, geomancities are, uh, are more expensive. Uh, they're definitely something you should avoid if you're, unless you're doing um, something with needs dynamic movement, for instance, in like flow graph or so. Uh, but yeah, for this scene, I was just bashing this together, uh, and I just copy a geomancity over and over again because it's kind of, it's easy. <laughs> so let's um, just be honest, because you're lazy. Right? Yeah, because I'm lazy. Yeah, yeah. and uh, and also, uh, yeah, it's it's just one of those things where it's like, possibly it makes a difference. Um, but I guess it's maybe like 10 frames a second distant difference, and I'm like 108 frames a second. Yeah. How greedy do you want to get? You know, like, <laughs> it's, just, it's just like... VR needs to run at 90 FPS. I'm, That's when you need to be... The thing that greedy. I love about CryEngine is that moment when you've got your, you know, your high-end assets, your mega scans, whatever, in there, and you know, you're just copying and pasting, and it just doesn't slow down, because this renderer is so fast. Um, it can handle just so many polygons. And instances as well. Yeah, and the instances are yeah a huge uh, a huge plus. Um, um, I know you use a lot of groups. Now you showed groups in the last yeah, webinar. Yeah. Uh, question I have is with the groups, does that kind of combine things on a renderer level into one draw call, I, or is that something that you need to do on an asset level? I don't think it does. I think it is just. Uh, still copying a usable, that stuff. A, a user interface thing rather than a renderer thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you would still get a big performance hit by copying an object with lots and lots of stuff in there. Um, with brushes, I can't remember if you can group brushes. I'm not too sure about that. Um, mm -hmm. That might be a reason why I was using geomancies. Yeah. I don't know. But once you got um, it fixed, you can always just convert them out to brushes later. Yeah, right? you can. When, when you find where they've yeah. moved that particular tool. Exactly. Uh, and also, I would say don't threat too much about this performance loss between geom entities and brushes. I think this is, it's not as much as you'd think. Um, for a game though, of course, if you're trying to ship a final game, this might be something you'd look at, you know, maybe at the very end of production when you no the other thing to worry about, yeah, nothing else to worry pass. about. Yeah, you're doing an optimization pass, then you're like, oh, you know, really cool is if all of these geom entities would be brushes, and then it maybe makes it more... Saves uh, three frames a second. Yeah, it would save a few frames, um, definitely. Uh, it's quite interesting how DirectX 12 is, uh, works with the with the draw calls uh, and how it's merging stuff together. So it's something you can really think about on, not so much in the editor, but more about if you are um, creating assets. So for instance, a scene like this, what would be way, way better for DirectX 11 would be if I would have actually taken this scene and brought it back into Max, and then export it all as one object. In which case, it would use you know way less draw calls. But with DirectX 12, it's not really necessary because we're kind of auto merging uh, uh, draw calls together, or it's auto merging draw, draw calls together on the GPU. Uh, so a scene like this is actually yeah it runs really good. I, there's I've had a demo before in the past where I was actually told that I should stop optimizing uh, because uh, DirectX. 12 was basically not benefiting enough because I was, you know, I was basically exporting all of my assets uh, as these great big chunks because I was used to doing that to make DirectX 11 run so quickly. Um, 
So in the end, they told us, stop optimizing. We want it to look like there's a huge difference between DirectX 12 and DirectX 11. Because, um, yeah, otherwise you don't see the benefit. Um, so yeah, DirectX 12 is great. You don't need to worry about uh, merging so many things together. Uh, oh yeah, so what I was doing, putting uh, depth of field. So there's a bit of an annoying thing you have to do for this to work. You need to create a director node, and then you need to parent the camera to the director node, and then you need to put in the camera track here, uh, the camera name. And there's a reason for this. It's so that you can actually have multiple cameras per your sequence, and you can actually use this camera track to switch between those various cameras. So you can see now, once I've done that, I can see you can see it, everything's gone blurry. So it's now using my uh, depth of field. Um, mm -hmm. So now I can put my focal range up here. Uh, I'm just going to hit save before I do that, just in <laughs> case we crash. Um, I'm a compulsive saver. I can't stop. Uh, it's better better to be that way than to yeah. lose two hours of work. Oh, I have. <laughs> That's why. Um, so yeah, cool. you can see now that I'm getting that nice. What I was explaining before about detail levels, um, you're immediately getting that when you put the depth of field on. And the cool thing is now I can go with the blur and I can see sort of just how much blur do I want. Do I really want to get that kind of super blurry background and then this area Sorry. here is uh, a bit less. You can kind of play with that blur amount function that's there in the, in the depth of field settings just to see which one looks best. Um, of course, I'm a bit cheating here because I already had some nice lighting in place in the scene. Uh, and of course, all, all the assets placed already. Uh, but you can see that this is just a case of like, you know, if I, if I delete a few of these, I'll, I'll kind of redo the ground for you now just to show you like what my process is there. Um, and just show you how lazy I am at actually doing this. Like it's it's really not rocket science. It just, just is a case of um, having a few assets and, and how to kind of place those. So. The asset I'm using mostly for this, if I delete all the other ones. Um, yeah, just delete a few out. So you can see now how it looks without any of those assets. It's now this kind of typical gamey looking uh, 3D. Uh, it's, it's kind of it's completely flat. There's no detail there. It's just not looking so great. And another way we could kind of, you could make this look good for a game is of course using displacement map. Um, but because I'm a cinematic artist, I just want this shot to look good, and I just, you know, I want it to look as photoreal as possible. So for me, I'm just going to be using scan geometry and placing it, and, and basically trying to get it to look uh, as good as possible via just a lot of assets. So you can see where you've uh, where you've lift, lifted those rocks up in the end, and now casting a shadow against the, the oh, large yeah. rock. Is yeah. it possible to show us how we can tweak the the shadow map? Because that's a, a good point to yeah, use yeah. as like a point of reference. How do what do you change? What C bars do you change to get better results? Yeah, I mean the the actual look right now is pretty much just cringing out of the box. That's what I mean. Yeah. Um, so what? How can we tweak that? If we go to console here, you can type shadow, and this will bring up every single shadow C bar in the cryengine, um, which can be pretty daunting at first. But what you'll find is that some of them are very useful. Um, so for instance, I go into E underscore shadows max text res. Uh -huh. You can see that this is currently set to 1024. Yeah. So I can actually, well, hopefully. 4096. <laughs> check. Well, check. Let's check if it works at 2K uh, first. So if I type 2048, and now you can see my shadow has improved in quality a bit. Uh, if I then try, uh, let's see. Yeah. So that's 4K shadow map resolution now. Uh, and it kind and of it looks a lot less soft as a result because the, exactly. the resolution's increased. Uh, so the resolution is increased, and that of course reduces the softness. But we can actually get that softness back uh, by again, if you go into console, uh, I should have dock this somewhere because it makes a bit more sense. Mm -hmm. um, if I go into the console again, you can go to the shadow jittering. So if we set the shadow jittering there to zero, you see it's now super sharp. It's actually a very very sharp. Very edge. sharp edge, yeah. Uh, then if I set that to like something like 15, you can now oh. see this like very nice gradient that's there. You know, of course, it has to be in a way. You know, you have to think about does this make sense for the lighting that I'm trying to produce? If it's something that's like a you know scene with some leaves, or you know, it's maybe the it depends how sort of foggy the scene is. If the scene's quite foggy, you want shadows that are a bit more diffuse, a bit more you know lots of gradients and bounces going around. 
uh, if you've got a very, you know, if it's a scene like this with the sun, actually this makes sense for it to be very, you know, it's a clear sky, there's a really clear blue sky, and it doesn't make sense for there to be any cloudy uh, sort of uh, gradients going on there. So this shadow should actually be pretty sharp. Uh, I think I'll just go back to the default there of the, the shadow jittering 2.5. Uh, maybe a bit more because I went up to 4K. Kind of ruins the edge a bit, but yeah. Uh, and now I've got very, very sharp shadows. Um, but for a scene like this, I don't think it makes such a huge difference. Uh, I think for that leave scene that I was doing, it made a bit more of a, an impact because uh, it was sort of a macro scene. Just how macro it was, yeah. yeah it was it's very noticeable. Uh, but here, you know, it does make a cool impact to the, you know, just how crystal clear that shadow looks. It's yeah, it looks less life. like a game engine now and more like a rendering out of something like Max or Maya that's mm. done offline, so... Uh, another component of lighting that's really nice and useful, of course, is the SSAO, uh, I think I showed last time, uh, SS, sorry, SSDO, it's actually called now. Um, It'll be in your go in the, thing uh, in the top right, probably. Yeah, maybe it's terrain. Lost. It's further down there on your properties. Oh, Scroll down. One. Yeah. It should be there. No, no. I mean level settings. <laughs> it's disappeared. Uh, let me see. Level explorer. No. Well, what you can do is uh, reset the layout if you go. Oh, all I I know where it might be. <laughs> hidden behind. See if it, it just hid hid one of my panels behind. Ah, oh, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So here's here's a level uh, settings panel, um, which is. Just uh, in the wrong place right now, <laughs> uh, but you can see there I've got this total illumination, which I'm using to make a bit of a sort of a bounce there. You can kind of use that to tweak the, you know, just how much, how much, how much of a light or fill light is going it's into kind the of like an ambient light, right? Exactly. To remove any completely black sections. Yeah, and and that's sort of like you know look at your reference uh, it's always helps to have a really good reference or a set of reference images i'm not sure so i'm not saying you should take one image and just copy that one out right but you should definitely have a number of references of a very similar time of day and sort of eyeball um you know so sort of how how the lighting looks for those uh, what was useful in this scene is because i had the photo backgrounds i could kind of match my lighting to those and then it, you know keep doing that uh, basically eyeballing how the values look on the light side versus the values on the the, the dark sides um, so yeah that makes a huge difference the total illumination uh, other thing that makes a big difference is the SSAO amount so if I turn that off you can see how that looks uh, and then if I pump that up again you can see all the little nooks and crannies just get all these nice I use the word again nooks and crannies is fine it's a technical term it's cool it's nooks and crannies all yeah. the intricate corners of the of the model yeah, uh, even on the, and you can see even on the top there, the actual texturing is getting a bit of detail just from having that SSAO amount pumped up a bit. Um, so yeah, it really, really depends, you know, if you if you do use these values, of course, don't go too crazy, but a bit of extra SSAO, it can really make a difference, especially with uh, that trying to, like what you were saying, faking that look of a, a real time, uh, of a, um, a ray trace render, mm -hmm. uh, but in real time. Uh, so with scans, like usually what I'm doing uh, is I'm using. I mean, pretty much I'm, I'm. It's as if I was editing this image in Photoshop. I take a bunch of rocks like these, and I try and identify exactly what in the image looks like a video game. So right now we have this obvious line here between this rock and the ground, uh, and this is making it look like a you know, typical game from you know, 2004 or something <laughs> in that they've not got anything that breaks up that geometry. So what I can do is I can go in and just kind of go in, duplicate my uh, various rocks and kind of rotate those around a bit and just get them to go in all of the little, uh, all the recesses, all the gaps between the rocks You can kind of control how much it goes up there. And should, if your lighting and materials are already set up fairly well, it will always look somehow pretty decent. Uh, and you'll be able to 
get nice results quite quickly just by rotating these around. And this is like the, the semi painstaking bit. Like exactly. So, so this is the part that takes up a lot of time. Uh, it's just a case of having the time to spend to uh, sort of nicely, um, yeah, nicely fill out scenes with assets. So, so where do you draw the line? Because obviously you could literally sit there and place rocks till you die. Oh. Where, where, where do you draw the line? Go right, okay, that's good enough. Because when it comes to game art, you can, you, li you you have to be able to go right. That'll do. I need to move on to the next section. Well, the good the good thing at least is that uh, in some ways, performance and optimization will do that for you. Uh, if you're you know sitting there placing you know hand placing rock after rock and after rock for hours and hours and hours, um, you're going to lose your mind. Yes. Uh, so that's <laughs> that's, <laughs> that's something. The first, that's the yeah. first thing you don't want. And to also, happen. and also, it's uh, it's a case of you're going to lose performance. And eventually, you're just never going to be able to run that scene in a game. Uh, you're never going to be able to even render your cinematic, even probably. So at some point, you need to. That is the thing with CryEngine, with especially with little rocks like these. You know, these can run on a mobile. They're so cheap. You know, I don't know if you've seen just how low poly those are, um, but they are super low poly assets there. Uh, and yeah, if you see I flip this over, you can see the edges there. They're just completely. I don't know if we've got the wire. Does the wireframe view work? I think it should do. Uh, let's have a see if we can switch to wireframe there. Uh, Bring up your uh, your views, stick it onto your layout, and you can have wireframe view if you recall all your different view modes. Oh yeah, this yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. I'm this pretty is, sure wireframe is also there. this is also pretty useful. For, um, we showed this last time, all these different view modes you can use for uh, various textures. I think one of these is wireframe. Uh, maybe not. Either that or it's the, uh, the renderer options, it's wireframe under the display. Yeah. The display, uh, if you click the drop down, it's probably hidden in there somewhere as wireframe. Here is, is wireframe usually. That's where I first look for it. I just never usually ah. use. I I never go wireframe. I'm, <laughs> I'm a guy that likes his uh, his real rendering. Um, but yeah, you can see there. It's it. Everything in this uh, this scene isn't very CG. high poly. Yeah. So poly count isn't something that really. Um, uh, is, it fro is it frozen? No, no. Oh, it's going. Go okay. One person struggling, so it doesn't uh. update till both people have got it. So okay. Don't worry. So. It is um, <laughs> So usually the way that I would, yeah, I would usually work that I have quite low resolution, low poly assets, uh, and then I would rather have sort of high res textures and uh, make sure the textures and materials are set up correctly, and that way you're actually having quite an op, you actually have quite an optimized scene uh, that still looks you know physically accurate, because um, you don't actually need insanely uh, detailed silhouettes most of the time. And you can actually cover up a lot of the silhouette issues with uh, just sort of nice placement of assets. Tweaking of things, yeah. Um, Especially with uh, tessellation now and displacement mapping, you, you can get away with a lot without having to do too much effort. Exactly. Uh, yeah, so with these I just kind of slot these slot into place. In. Slot these into place around the... Uh, and actually the, the cool thing is the rotation tool actually makes it quite easy. You know, that's, that's, really that's nice. another Englishism, isn't it? Plonk them in. Plonk, yeah. yeah. Just plonk the things in. Just go in, rotate. Just go I mean, of course, like I'm thinking about it a little bit, but mostly I'm just kind of doing the. It's the dirty work of kind of breaking up lines. I'm thinking about how can I get this to look a bit less like a game scene. You know, if I get like I get happy surprises sometimes. Like like just now I rotated that, and you can see that down here in the corner I have these couple of little rocks that are, you know adding a bit of cool detail. Um, so. I'll just kind of leave those there, oh, and then nice. now I have this nice little detailed area here. Um, and yeah, then then it's just a case of like uh, I think I have I do a bit of a here's one I made earlier moment. Um, I'll get one of my uh, groups. This is actually just the same asset, but uh, just grouped together into a big section, so that I'm because I'm lazy. I don't like to. You know, do this all the time. So I just kind of so you see the normal, you know, typical terrain. It doesn't look bad or something. It looks like a typical game terrain. But you know, if, and if I would add displacement mapping, it would probably improve it quite a lot. 
um, but I can just bring out some real geometry into there uh, and just give that bit of extra detail uh, which is okay as long as your lighting is set up correctly and that it's not adding sort of uh, unnecessary details because um, of course we've already got a place for our eye to rest which is actually the, the sort of depth of field in this image um, so as long as you're thinking about that and think like thinking through how that works uh, you can always make stuff that looks pretty nice uh, and this is really like this comes down to like okay you're painting in 3d pretty much you know you're always going back and you're seeing what what is something you can improve um, and it's this is actually a, a nice meditative part you know this is the <laughs> Bob Ross bit where you just kind of go and like oh, I like this it's just a happy little rock happy little rock here you know <laughs> except I don't actually have to have any skill like he has because I don't actually have to paint any of this so um, yeah, that's actually the great thing about 3D is that you can just... Anyone can do this. Uh, you don't need to be able to draw. Um, and the cool thing is that now the asset libraries are getting so so good. You know, stuff like, like what the Quixel guys are doing. And uh, so recently there's a scanned asset library of, of statues that people have gone to museums and they've, sta they've scanned high resolution 3D statues uh, from basically, I think, like five or six different leading museums uh, and they look perfect you know and it's just like I mean just imagine this in in 10 years you know when everybody's got these assets and they're very, very readily available um, is this is going to be something that's just like you know, people will uh, people are going to leap on this stuff and I think they're even going to get cheaper and cheaper um, yeah I already noticed lots of people in Gumroad are selling uh, you know huge amounts of stuff uh, and, and even giving away some stuff for free so 